okay, so I have here Sherry Chiroki, and she's a very special guest. Uh, she was my first yoga teacher, and uh, I found her coincidentally uh, looking for a yoga class in downtown where I live, and a friend of mine told me about her class, so I joined the class. I love her style and her class, and since then, she's been my teacher and my mentor. So. Uh, she's a very special guest. Um, and um, so Sherry, why don't you tell us about yourself, like your, your certifications and your, your education, all of that. Okay. Well, I was born in, and raised in Dallas, so I am a, a native Dallas. I uh, went to school here, went to college here. I have two degrees in herbal medicine, uh, master herbalist degrees. I have a, several certifications in Ayurveda. I have a bachelor's in body science. I have a bachelor's in business and I have an MBA. Uh, so th those are my degrees that I have. Uh, and I've been studying herbology, natural health for oh, well over 40 years. Yes. So, and yoga. I've been practicing yoga over 40 years, teaching for over 30 years. Yes. Yeah, so you have a lot of experience. Okay, and a great education. Yes, we love that when we go to your classes and you give us tips on herbs and oils and things to eat. You know, it's so complementary of yoga and Ayurveda. Okay, so, so tell us... Um, why did you decide to become a teacher? How, when that, that shift happened from practicing to actually say, I, I want to teach yoga? And you do it for a living, right? That's all you do right now. Yes, yes. And I will ask you about how were you able to do that because that is so hard to do. But anyway, how did you become interested in teaching? Okay, well, I had a teacher that asked me to sub for her at one time. And at that point, I didn't have any interest in teaching. I just loved going to the classes because how it made me feel good. And I said yes to her. And that's, that's where it all started. So I got in the class and I just taught exactly how she taught. So that's, that's how I started. And then not too long after that, I moved to New York and I decided I wanted to teach. I still wanted to teach. So I went to a place, they hired me, and I just figured it, you know, I just figured it out from there because there was no certifications at that time. And I had two yoga books and I would go through those books, looking at pictures, trying to figure out what postures to teach the, the day that I would teach. And that, that's how I did it. And it was, it was amazing because when I first started teaching there there wasn't that many in the class but after a year the room was packed i mean it was packed and i'd had people come up to me and say wow i just feel at the end i feel like i'm floating out of here and telling me how good they felt and so at that point i knew i was doing something right uh, i knew i was helping people to be calm and New Yorkers, that's a, that's a tough crowd to, to deal with. So yeah. Very then I moved back to Dallas and I wanted to continue to teach. And so that's what I did. I taught part time for many years and I had gone in partnership with a person. We opened a studio and I wanted to do a training then, but that partnership didn't work out. So we parted ways. And then later on, I decided I, I wanted to give a teacher training program. So I did everything I needed to do, created the curriculum, uh, presented it to a yoga studio where I was working, and she gave the okay. So I did it there. And then she closed down. And then I just, I kept it. I just kept going with it. Okay. Good. And... Tell us, uh, uh, in your experience, how did you make the transition? I, I know about you a little more than the audience listening, right? I know you were working at Neiman Marcus, right? For yes. Me. 
and other places. And then slowly you made your transition to do, teach yoga alone. So you, you, you know you do that uh, full time. So that's the dream of many yoga teachers, uh, not particularly mine necessarily, right? But um, so tell us for those people who are wanting to do that and it's so difficult to, to leave alone from teaching yoga, how do you do it? Well, I had to teach part time because I had to pay my bills. And that's how I started out. And that people get to know you. And then, you know, you get more classes, more classes. And then eventually, um, well, what happens is a lot of studios go out of business. A lot of places go out of business. And then you're like, uh oh, uh, I need to find more classes. So eventually I built a room in the back of my house. It's specifically for yoga. So I don't have the overhead of a strip mall. The, the rents in those places are extremely high. So that's, that's how I did it. I just built a room. So I own it. And the rent's not as high. And so that's, that's what it made it easy to transition into doing it full time. Okay, that's a very good tip. Yes, so owning your own place, maybe a house, building something on the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. And uh, one of the things that I also uh, notice about you, Sherry, is that you are very concentrated and very articulate, very, very focused on what you're doing. So it's like you have a very business mind, but, but you're still a yogi, right? Like you're very humble. You're not materialistic. You live a simple life but you have a very good sense of business. Very good, I think you're very good at it. And your master's in business administration probably helps. So that's very good for keeping up a business. Right? Yes, that helps, yeah. yeah. That was one of the best decisions I made uh, was to get the master's in business. Yeah, so very good, Sherry. Okay, so tell me, um, what is yoga in your opinion? What is your definition of yoga? What you have learned in your experience and from the books maybe? Well, yoga means union, uh, union with the divine, union with yourself, uh, yoking together, bringing everything together. It's, it's a lifestyle is actually what it is. And you bring every part of your life into this union, uh, the body, uh, working on the body. But the main thing is working on the mind. So we learn in yoga that you have to purify the mind and purify the body, purify the speech, purify what, what are you putting into your mind? What are you putting into your body? It's all of that, bringing all of that together and focusing on the goal of yoga, which is to become enlightened, uh, reaching that higher state. And, and that's the whole thing of yoga, union, bringing all of that together. It's not just practicing asanas. And a lot of people, when you say yoga, that's the first thing that comes to their mind. But it really should not be the first thing. It should be all the practices, the eight limb path, um, the yamas and niyamas. Those are part of the eight limb path, which is nonviolent, speaking the truth, non-stealing, uh, conserving your energy, not being attached keeping you know your cleanliness the environment clean your mind clean your speech clean the body clean and then you have being content with whatever the situation uh self-study doing austerities making yourself do the practices even when you don't feel like doing it uh seeing the divine in everything and everyone and those th that's yoga and without those there is no yoga. And that's the first thing is getting your mind straightened out, uh, working on the mind. And then the others start falling in place. Then you do, you have asanas, you have pranayama, breath control. Then you start getting into withdrawing the senses and that's getting into meditation, focusing the mind, meditating until you reach that higher goal of yoga. So that's, that's what it's all about. 
li living the life, knowing, being aware, what's your thoughts? How are you reacting and acting towards people? Uh, your actions. Yes, yes. I remember from the beginning, you always made emphasis on, on th those practices. And because you're training teachers, right? On your right. courses. So for somebody who just wants to practice yoga as an exercise, that's fine. That's a personal choice. But right. for teachers, it is very important to not only do the asanas, the, the flexibility part. So that's part of my message, right? Also on this uh, interview series that I'm doing is just to reach out to people and say, yoga is so broad and it can do so many things for you, change your life almost because it really works on the mind and, and the body connection. It's not only for the body. So yeah, when most people hear yoga, it's like, oh, yoga exercise, immediately, right? The connection is there, but it's more, yeah. Exactly. And I would say, you know, when they come into the asana practice, it's a good thing because it's like going through the back door of yoga. They get, they go into the class and then they leave and they're like, wow, you know, I'm, I don't feel as stressed. I feel calmed down. What is this? Yes. And then it sparks their interest into to learning more about it. Right. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Good. Okay. So you mentioned the yamas and niyamas, right? For, so for somebody who has never heard of that, can you explain a little bit more about it? Like where you can find those principles and what books where do they come from? What can they do for your health? Well, the yamas and niyamas, it's called the eight limb path of Ashtanga yoga. And you find it in the yoga sutras of Patanjali. So the yoga sutras is like uh, having your great psychiatrist right <laughs> there, you know, reading it because he talks about the function of the mind, how the mind works. And he tells us, this is what you can do to get your mind straightened out, to, to become healthy, be, to become happy. And, and there's much more to the Yoga Sutras, but that's one of the main things. He's one of the great uh, teachers of psychology. Yes. And then the Bhagavad Gita is another book that's really good of how to live the yoga lifestyle. Uh, it teaches uh, different paths of yoga. But one of the main things about the Bhagavad Gita that people have a hard time with is in the beginning, it talks about this war and it has all these Sanskrit names that most people can't even pronounce. And they put it down. They're like, oh, you know, I can't even pronounce this stuff. I'm putting it down. Exactly. But if they, if they understand where it comes from, it comes from a epic called the Mahabharat. And that's one of the great epics that comes from India. And what it does, it teaches us that this war, this battle is within us. We're fighting our internal battles every day. We're fighting our negative aspects. We're trying to cultivate our noble aspects. So the Bhagavad Gita gives these different paths of yoga. This is how you conquer that internal battle. This, this is how you win this internal battle. Yes, that is interesting. Yeah. And it makes me think, you know, as a student of mental health, that there's really nothing new under the sun, right? Like, People no. have been dealing with these problems, you know, depression, anxiety, um, I don't know, uh, panic attacks, uh, you name it, any mental health situation. They, we have been dealing with these for thousands of years, right? And people knew that certain practices uh, linking the body and the mind will help improve a lot of things. Maybe not all of the things that human beings have, right? But a lot of them with practice, you can get much better. And we are still dealing with those issues, mental health, anxiety, depression, stress, and, and people just want to pop a pill, right? And go to the doctor and get a, a medication instead of trying more natural methods, right? 
Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, if I can take a magic pill, that's the easy way out. I don't have to do any work. And I think a lot of the problems nowadays in our modern society is people, you know, the media, they're looking at their cell phones all the time. I go to the airport and usually I'm sitting for an hour or two waiting for the plane. I, I like to get there early. And people are glued to the cell phone. They get on the airplane, they're glued to the cell phone. They get off the plane, they're walking, looking at their cell phones. Uh, you have kids, cell phones, iPads, uh, television. Now, you know, we have commercial free television like Netflix and uh, I've been guilty of it. You can binge watch, you find a series and you're like, oh, I got to see the next one. I got to see the next one. People don't study there very much anymore. They don't go deeper. They don't go out into nature. It's, it's just a big distraction. And then they watch news and news should have the word bad in front of it. It's all bad news. <laughs> yes, it's, it's not very, I don't recommend people to watch the news anymore. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just negative. And so uh, if you look at video games, kids playing these violent video games, we're just bombarded with all kinds of media stuff and people just have a hard time breaking away from it and really studying, working on themselves. You know, read a book, um, go to classes, do something, get, get yourself away from all of this media stuff. Yes, I agree totally that that's part of a uh, personal growth, right? A lot of, I make a lot of emphasis on personal growth, coaching people. And one of those things, you know, it's always very good not to be glued to the TV or your phone or social media only for, you know, if you have a business and you want to promote or grow, it's okay, but not excessively like you don't live your life. You are living through a TV, through a phone, instead of going out there and living your life. Go hiking, go climbing, go to a park, you know, walk exactly. on the grass. All of those things are incredible for your health and your mental health. Exactly. And part of Ay Ayurveda, which is a sister science of yoga, it says go out in nature enjoy nature it is healthy it's rejuvenating yes and, and leave your cell phone somewhere else when you go out in nature yes please do all right good so now let's see i'm looking here at uh, some notes so have you talked about how yoga has changed your life has it made a big difference in your life has it helped you overcome any challenges that you want to share with us yeah, uh, well, you know, when I was a kid, I was very hyperactive. <clears throat> I couldn't sit still. I had a hard time focusing in school. Um, I would be in school and I'd start doing homework and I'd do real well in the beginning. And then I would just, it was too much. I was overwhelmed and I would give up, uh, totally give up. So there was no focus there. And I, probably a lot of it was diet. Uh, you know, we had meat three times a day. We had lots of sugary stuff. And those are not things that give you calmness and focus. So that was one thing. At one point in my life, I would say I was somewhat addicted to drugs. It was an escape. And yoga helped me turn all of that around. Uh, I ended up going to college. I never thought I was smart enough to go to college. So I, I went to college and then I got on the honor roll and I was like, wow, okay, this isn't so bad. But I was able to focus. I was able to write the papers, do the homework. Yeah. And that was started out with an associate's degree. And then I thought, well, I may as well go to a bachelor's degree. And I got through that and went through it with honors. And then I decided, well, this isn't so bad. So I went on to get a master's degree and I was able to focus and accomplish it and finish it. So that was one major change in my life. Uh, and I just think that being able to focus and be calm, 
learning to be calm no matter what. And that's one of the key factors. I know last time, last month I went to Mexico and it was really interesting because I had a uh, set up to ride the super shuttle. They canceled on me mm. that morning. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, great. Okay. Well, all right. Then I'm just like, I have a car. That's fine. Didn't want to drive it there, but I'm, I, I can do this. So I went to the airport and my gate changed and that was no big deal, but it kept changing. Oh. And finally the last change, I just kind of gazed at my cell phone. I, I just looked at the number and I went to the gate and I'm like, well, nobody's here. What's going on? I looked at the cell phone again. It was in a different terminal. Wow. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. I'll just catch the shuttle, you know, go to the other terminal. And I, I got there just in time. Yeah. And then I got to Mexico and I ended up getting sick, but I was functional sick, had a headache and stomach disorder. But it was like none of that got to me. It was like, okay that's it is what it is so I just keep going and then on when I left to come home from from Mexico my 6 a.m. flight got canceled to 6 p.m. and I didn't really want to come home in the evening but I you know I looked at the positive I was like well at least I'm going home the same day yes so it's just when all these events like that happen keeping a calm mind because there's nothing you can do about it. If you, you get all mad and angry, it, it just makes everything worse. So that's one thing it's taught me. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I tried to live my life with whatever's happening. It's happening. Just let it happen. Yes. Yes. It is what it is. Yeah. So that's part that's really changed. Uh, just it's a transformation and that's what yoga it is is really transforming your life but again you have to do the work there's yes. no you know sitting back you have to do the work yeah I mean I'm up every morning uh, at, and meditating at four o'clock in the morning making yeah. myself get up and that's the work I sit for an hour yeah I know that about you yeah you go to bed very early and wake up yes <laughs> Yes. Yes. I've been trying to do that. Uh, and I can definitely relate to, to yoga, making people, people more patient and more living in the present, which is also another cornerstone of spiritual living, right? It's right. present, let go of things you cannot control, like flight cancellations, uh, Exactly. So many, happen, so many things happen when you travel. And yeah, just enjoy the moment. You cannot control it. So many things go into place when you're traveling. So just chill, enjoy. And for some people, it's very, very difficult to, to do that shift, that mindset. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be okay with whatever is happening. Yeah. And also very interesting is that a lot of people think, what do you mean being okay with everything that happens? So if somebody is hitting me, I'm, I should be okay with it. So obviously not, right? When we say that, it, right. you, you have to say no, get away from me, don't hit me, don't ever do that again. That's standing up for yourself, right? You're not a doormat, but being okay with reasonable things, right? Like, exactly. It's, right. it's all in divine order. That's the thing. It's just, and I tell myself when things happen, I'm like, okay, it's in divine order. It's, it's not my divine order. It's yes. divine order. Yes, I, I love that. And actually, um, you know that, Sherry, that I go to uh, schools and organizations to teach um, life skills, workshops and classes and curriculum classes about self-esteem. And we have a program that targets high school kids and middle school kids and all kinds of kids, but in public schools mostly. So I, I came up with this hashtag that says, trust the life process. And I think the kids are enjoying it because my last session, we have 10 sessions and I, the last one, I, I tried to, to share with them a little bit of yoga, right? So without telling them this is yoga, but telling them, uh, you know, a lot of things are going to go wrong in your life. 
you are 14, 15, 16 years old, that's a very difficult time sometimes. You know, um, a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure on kids to perform, to be the best, etc. And I always tell them, and, and I'm talking about kids that come from very poor backgrounds. Maybe they live in foster care. Uh, maybe they have violence going on at home, right? A lot of the, the kids, so I tell them, no matter how difficult your situation is right now, try always to trust the life process. You know, trust that you're living this experience, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be better later on. And I think they, they, they think about it. It's like, wow, no, nobody has told me that really. Not like that, right? Right. And, you know, you can always try to find what am I learning from this? What am I learning? And I think that's a good way too to look at it. Uh, even though it, even if, even if it's a difficult situation, it's well, what am I learning from this or what can I learn? Yes. Mm -hmm. What can I learn? Yeah. You can learn so many things for, from every situation, mostly the difficult situations. You can learn so much about oh, your yeah. character, about your own strength. Exactly. But you are in the middle of chaos. It's so hard to see it. But later on, you say, wow, I came out okay, and I'm now I'm stronger. All right. Exactly. So let's go to, um, so Sherry, what makes a good yoga teacher in your opinion? I'm asking that to a lot of my guests that are yoga teachers. What makes a good yoga teacher? I, I would say following the yoga path and especially the eight limb path, because there, there really is no yoga without it. And if you're not practicing uh, the teachings, then you're nothing but an exercise instructor. That's all you are. Right. Uh, a yoga teacher needs to be an example for other people. You need to live the life. And I mean, you could be a good exercise stru instructor and instruct yoga postures, but that's all you'll ever be. You have, you have to follow the path. Yes. Yes, good advice. Okay. So I want to get to a very special topic uh, with you, but I want to know, um, what is spirituality for you? How do you what define is... spirituality? Ah, that's a good question. Um, well, spirituality is your relationship with yourself and the divine. And some people call the divine God. And, and that's okay. I, I prefer calling it the divine creator, the divine creator that created everything, created us and all the things around us. And that consciousness flows through everything. And so spirituality to me is connecting with that pure consciousness. And it may take many lifetimes to get there, but just connecting with it and knowing the divine is with you at all times. And thinking of yourself, because the teachings uh, teach us that I am God, I am divine. So if I am divine, how does a divine person act? If I am divine, then I need to act like a divine person. And that's connecting with the spirituality. Uh, meditating, and that's, a, that's a good way of connecting. Uh, I can't emphasize enough meditation because then you start feeling that connection with that divine presence. Yes. And I know everyone has a different a concept of spirituality. And mine is not a religion. It's not at all a religion. It's living a, a, a spiritual path, like the yamas and niyamas, being kind to people, being compassionate, being aware of your yourself at all times what are you thinking are you thinking good thoughts about people are you thinking bad thoughts are you judging people again how would a divine person live their life what would a divine person be thinking and yeah. so to me that's spirituality 
Yes, I really like that definition, Sherry, that the divine is like we are aspiring to be as close as a divine being would be and behave. And I, I heard that from other spiritual teachers in India and, and Asia primarily, that they, they really make the emphasis on that, that we, we don't really know if there is a God or not and what is it exactly, but for sure there is something else going on that created this fantastic world and universe we live in. And it's, it's really getting into people's mind now. I think we are starting to see that, that we, each of us can really be as close as possible to the divine, to a divine being. Like, and, and that includes all of those principles of nonviolence, behaving well, with thoughts, being positive. Respecting your body with the food you put in, the words you say, everything. That is what it is, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that's great. I mean, if we can all achieve that, there will be so less problems in this world, I think. Exactly. Someday we'll get there. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, okay, so let's talk a little bit about women and okay. the modern culture uh, because, um, you know, we hear a lot of words and mystic concepts that sometimes people are confused, right? Like they, they're not sure, what do you mean by the divine feminine and the sacred feminine? And, and what is this thing with women, you know, rising up against men? And, you know, there's a lot of competition going on in the media with women and men and all of that. But, um, um, so to me, um, when I go to your classes, you know, uh, we hear you a lot saying, you know, women, um, it's, it's very good that you keep in mind that being a woman, you have a lot of power, but you also have to preserve that femininity, right? That you represent the, all the women in the world, respect yourself, respect your body, including not, not, um, be doing yoga and showing off your body with super shorts, things like that, right? Not right. that only women who do that, you know, that's their choice, but there is this school of thought of women, right, like you, that think is very important that women keep their place of respect and dignity in society. And yoga can provide moral principles uh, to be like that, right? Like a divine being. That's why we call the sacred feminine, right? Like we are, and men are too. There's also the sacred masculine, right? And then you can get into tantra and all of that. But tell us a little bit about your concepts about women in our modern world and why it is so important that we empower women to preserve that femininity and and. Okay. Uh, wow. That's like, whew. that's a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's good. Uh, and we have to understand, even though we're female, we also have that male energy within us and men have female energy. So we have both male and female. Uh, and nowadays you find more women coming into yoga, which is good because at one time it was very male dominant women, uh, and certain lineages weren't allowed to do the, the, have the teachings. And you even find it in other religions where women were not allowed to have the deeper teachings. Uh, but nowadays, the good thing is we are free to uh, really dive into the yoga teachings Women do have uh, a lot of personal power that most of the time they don't know they have. And one of the, another story, epic in India is the Ramayana. Some people call it the Ramayana, uh, which is a story about Ram and Sita. And they were, um, Ram was exiled into the forest and Sita was his wife and she went with him. And she was uh, such a divine female. She was, she's like a good example for how we women should live our lives. Nowadays, uh, women 
have gotten to where they, they idolize movie stars. Uh, they want to be sexy and they don't dress appropriately. It, it, you know, sometimes I'll see even movie stars like, like put some clothes on. <laughs> why are you, why are your breasts hanging out? Why, why are you doing that? Who are you trying to impress? Yeah. Uh, a divine being a, di a divine feminine being would never dress like that. Uh, I know I went to the beach one time and this person had on a thong swimming suit and she was wanting to have a man in her life. And I was thinking, well, what kind of a man are you going to attract in your life if you're wearing something like that? Uh, you, I wouldn't want that kind of a man in my life that is attracted to somebody who doesn't dress appropriately, professionally. <clears throat> so, but again, we have all these, the media, the, the singers, the, the actresses, uh, <clears throat> advertisement, this is going to make you sexy and that's going to make you sexy. This toothpaste is going to make you sexy. But if you, <laughs> yeah, if you think, if you think about it, how is toothpaste going to make me sexy? And why, you know, it's just, it's crazy. And people get so caught up in that. And then the competition, well, why, why should we compete with each other? That just creates negativity. Yes. Yes. It's, it's important. And I can see how it can be confusing mostly for teenagers and maybe young women in their early, you know, twenties, maybe. Um, it can be confusing because they are bombarded by these, like you say, sexy images, show your body, overemphasizing your sexuality as a female, as a woman. And, but on, on the other hand, you know, I like to also keep in mind that, you know, you see a lot of Indian goddesses um, in sculptures and paintings, and they are showing their curvy, they show their curves and they show their breasts you know, and you can see the feminine, but that's beautiful. You know, that's, there's nothing wrong with being a, a curvy woman or however you are built, but there's nothing wrong with a female body. It's beautiful, right? Right. But there's a difference between showing your body in private to a partner that you want to show your body, but not to the public entirely walking on the street for everyone, right? Over exactly as in your sexuality as a woman because then it's not special maybe right well, it's I don't not sacred I it's not sacred anymore and it's like what are you are you overcompensating for a lack of something within you when you do that when you dress that way yes perhaps that's a very good question and in, in your growth that you can ask right like what am i trying to compensate for exactly yeah um, yeah and I think we women, we need to learn to love ourselves, not in an egotistical way, but loving ourselves. And if we truly love ourselves, we're going to dress appropriately. We're going to conduct ourselves appropriately. And that goes for men too, uh, because we have that, that true love of the self. Yes, Sherry, that's very important. And you mentioned that a lot in your courses and classes, right? To, to um, just keep in mind that uh, you have to respect your, you know, your body and yourself and love yourself, love yourself. And not in the ego sense, but on the, this is my value, this is my worth as a woman, it's not in my body, right? Because exactly. we, you know, bring a lot, a lot of value to society. Um, yeah, men too, uh, but we bring a uh, value that is way more than just the looks, just the body, or just procreating babies, right? Creating babies. Right. It's, it's way more. And, and I want to link that to what you said before, when you said that the yoga culture is being dominated by, by males. And it's true. You know, like when I wanted to, I was searching for leader, female leaders, spiritual speakers, spirit, spiritual teachers that are that are women and you cannot find many you there's just a few um 
very few counted with my with my fingers right and men you have so many men that have been very outspoken and articulate explaining what is the spirituality what is yoga what is personal growth leadership and women uh, not so much historically right right so now i think it's time to provide that forum and platform for women to you know be self-assured and assertive and and talk you know speak up teach you know yeah and, and i good that you're so good at teaching and telling all these stories from india and things like that like you are very very well articulate educated and all that and you you speak very well you know conveying these messages that we need to hear oh well thank you thank you yeah and i think i think more women it, it'll change but even if you look at some of the native american cultures the women were involved with the elders now on you know the movies you see it doesn't show that uh, it just shows a western point of view and some of the tribes when they would uh, talk to westerners like treaties and stuff uh, the native americans would say where's your women how come they're not here involved because we we need that balance we don't need it to be, you know, unbalanced, shifting one way or the other. It needs to be a balance of both of us coming together and not having this war of the sexes. We all have something to offer. And when we work together, then we accomplish so much more than when we're apart. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, going back to the divine beings, right? We were created female and male there is femininity and masculinity in the world in on everything you know and we complement each other we we should not be fighting you know like competing with each other that's going to yeah. it's going to destroy us it was going to destroy relationships yeah all right and um so we also talk a lot sharing your classes about um growing growing older as a woman or as a man, right? But we're talking right. about us, you and I, as women in our experience, right? So I really, really like your views and I totally agree um, that I really want to encourage other women to, to really listen to this, what we're gonna say and think about it. Like um, in our culture, growing older is something bad, right? When you start getting your grace and uh, you are not as flexible as before, or you don't have the energy that you had, or you're going into menopause. Uh, you know, like women can start menopause at 50 something, as early as 40 something, right? It varies a lot. So, so how to really start thinking about the concept of growing older is not necessarily something negative. It is a cycle of life, it's there for a reason, it's divine creation. And I love your, your phrase when you said, uh, older women are there in the tribe, right? Our tribe, modern tribe, to teach younger women and guide them as an example, right? And if you are depressed, sad, because your youth is, is, is gone, how are you gonna be present and strong and wise for younger women? Right, so it's so important that, that women really work on that, on being happy, always happy, right? We say, be always happy with whatever is happening, accept the growth, the age, the getting older, embrace it, and what do you have to offer from that growth, right? So tell us about your thoughts about that. Okay, well, I age with grace. I think that's the best, um, little saying is just age with grace because the, the alternative of aging is dying. <laughs> uh, so, you know, which would you rather do? And, and we're all going to go through this process of aging and you're going to lose your, you know, your youthful look and there's nothing wrong with that. And yes, you do become the tribe mother, especially menopause is a time of transformation and so many women complain about it they hate it they're this and that you know the hot flashes the night sweats um, I didn't have that many 
but I always looked at it as the heat, the fire. Fire is transforming. Heat is transforming. Your body is transforming. And you are. You Then you're the tribe mother. You're giving younger women the wisdom. You've been through all of these experiences in life. And so you have gained the wisdom. And now it's a time to share that wisdom, to help the younger women uh, with their, their life. And the gray hair, it's, it's, it took me a while to start to let my hair go gray. It was like, <laughs> oh, no, no, color. But then I got to the point, I didn't want to put those chemicals on my hair anymore. And of course, I was using the natural hair colors, but they still have chemicals. And if you think about it, that's close to the brain. Yes. Uh, and I just decided, let it go. Just be who I am. Uh, let the... Let the wisdom hair come through. Yes, I love it, Sherry. Very good. Yeah, and then the night sweats, when I would have those, I was like, well, this is like having my sweat lodge here. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever been in a sweat lodge, it's, it's letting go. It's, being, it's, a new, it's a rebirth. Yeah. Because a sweat lodge was originally like in the ground, and so then you were in Mother Earth and this heat, you know, intense heat. You were re being reborn and so that's basically um menopause is just being reborn into a another stage of your life uh, the hot flashes or it's just another stage of your life that again it's transformation and then and then actually sharing the knowledge yes yes i love that concept of the the fire right the agni of transformation and totally makes sense when you go on the hot flashes and all of that it's a transformation and it's your body signaling something that something is happening right it's, yeah. it's not very comfortable but I want to mention something I heard are, are you familiar with Eckhart Tolle yes Eckhart Tolle, yeah the German philosopher spiritual teacher so he had a, an amazing story of awakening, right? And he has huge following. He's very, very humble, very, very sweet, very nice, right? And he talks about um, women. Well, he talks about pain body in general. If you right. to it for Tolly, uh, he refers to pain body, to the pain inherited through gene history, you know, depending on your race, your ethnicity, your culture, you inherit a lot of things that create your emotional pain and suffering that we all have. So the goal, part of the goal of yoga is to, well, the main goal of yoga is to release suffering, right? Right. Overcome that suffering that human beings have since day one. And so Eckhart Tolle says, women have a very good opportunity to be aware because he talks a lot about consciousness and awareness every month when you have your period right it's signaling the pain right that pain that starts getting cramps and all of that is signaling um a, a change that is coming in a woman's body and that's a great opportunity to practice accepting that body pain that is there and it also comes with a lot of psychological pain, right? Because you hear all the women in your life complaining about the period, the menstrual period, the menopause. So all of that adds to your pain body. So Eckhart Tolle explains it very well. It's like, instead of um, instantaneously, automatically going to a pain mode, bad mood, me, you know, why do I have to put up with this? Look at it as a practice of staying with that suffering, with that pain, for transformation of the self and building that character. Isn't that beautiful? That is, that is, yeah. And we have to understand too, our menstrual cycles, um, it, it, it's an honor. We are creators of life. Uh, yeah. I know it takes, you know, a man too, but we're the ones that hold that life for nine months. Yes. And then we're usually the ones that nurture that life uh, once it's born for, you know, more so than what a man does. And so we are the, the, the creators of, of, of that life, that new life. And that should be, that's an honor to have that. 
Yeah, it is an honor. Yeah. And, and also, you know, um, I always say, no, because you are a woman and you can have babies, you, that means you have to have children, right? That's another topic that it is an honor. It is a great option, capacity for women to create life, but it's okay not to do it, you know? And I, found, I found a, another spiritual teacher in India. He has, a. um, million followers, probably more than one million. Um, Sadhguru, do you know, you know Sadhguru? Yeah. Yeah. So Sadhguru says, um, he said that he's going to create an award for women who decide not to have children because there's no need in our modern times to have so many children because there's so many people on this planet right? And we are still working on our next phase of evolution, our, our spiritual growth, betterment of the species. Like, why do you have to have children all the time? And he says, I applaud women who decide with conviction, right? Like, I'm okay. I don't want to have children. He applauds it and he supports that. And he says, that is your decision as a woman. It's, it's, it's great to have the option to do it, but if you exercise your option not to, don't feel bad about it. And, and I love when he said he's going to give an award. It's like, I'm, I'm going to be in that ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to have children, but it's, it's for all the women out there that are listening and they are thinking about not having, and you feel all the pressure from family, relatives, you know, if it's your decision and your partner's decision, just go with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, it has to be a personal decision. And personal decision is not letting friends and family in, influence what you feel is best for you because you know what's best for you. Yes, yes. And knowing your options, you have options. It's not an, ob yes. it's not an obligation to get married. It's not an obligation to have children. It's not an obligation to be in a relationship or, or a specific type of relationship. You know, we are free to do so many other things. Yes. Yes. All right. So we talked about, um, you know, the importance of mature women in our society, how uh, valuable they are. And actually one of my best friends, you know her, Anne-Marie, she's the yes. five. Seven, she's my mom's age and she's one of my best friends, if not my best friend, because she brings all this wisdom and advice, you know, that no, none of my friends my age can give me. All right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you're one of them, you know, you're so knowledgeable and very, very good friend. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's also uh, important, Sherry, to talk a little about uh, women helping women, right? Because sometimes we feel, I guess it's not only a treat uh, of wi women, uh, also with men, but competing with each other is not a good idea, right? Instead of pulling each other up, helping other women succeed and gain knowledge, and sharing the, the wealth, right? The wealth of knowledge and right. supporting each other. That's, that's important. And I always felt like you did that you know, always with your classes and your women, the women that go to your classes, you really help genuinely. Like, like I know you have helped a lot of women, you know, in different areas. And that is incredible. So we applaud you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. We, we need more Sherry. <laughs> um, did you have a mentor in your life, Sherry, that uh, a teacher, mentor, guru, whatever, who help you grow in your personal growth, spiritual development? I, I, I would say yes. Um, but I, I also say that this whole earth is uh, like a university and you're getting a PhD in human, humanhood. Um, but I've had people along the way ha who have been good mentors and who have helped and uh, I know one of my first yoga teachers was uh, just her example uh, was being a mentor. She, she was the one that got me into teaching. Yes. Uh, 
and I still occasionally stay in touch with her, not, not as much as I would like to, uh, but she was a, a, just being an example was, was the mentoring part. Uh, and yeah. I've, I've had other teachers uh, throughout my life. Uh, but I think, too, you know, yoga says develop that inner guru, that inner teacher. And I think that's really one of the main things is developing that, taking the wisdom from everyone that comes into our lives that contribute to the good of ourselves and to the good of others and pulling that in that wisdom and developing that own teacher mentor within. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. And so Sherry, we mentioned at the beginning that you are uh, certified as an Ayurvedic counselor or life coach, right? Right. And you also provide uh, Ayurveda counseling certifications at your, your yoga school. Alpha right. Yoga. And so I took a course with you, my first Ayurvedic course with you, and it was incredible. And then through you, I knew about PDI in India, right? Remember? Right. So you, you also have certification in Ayurveda from PDI. And PDI is a, it's a clinic and yoga school in, in India, different clinics in different places. And they also have a clinic in the Netherlands and small clinics in Europe. And so you told me about them and I said, well, I always wanted to go to India, so this is a good excuse to go and go to a specific place and see where it goes from there. So I went there uh, after I took Ayurveda with you. I went with them and it was a great experience to, to meet all of the people there, the doctors. So tell us, for the people who are listening, what is Ayurveda? and how it is a sister science of yoga and what can it do for people's health? Okay, well, Ayurveda is called the science of life and it's a sister science of yoga, which never ever should have been um, a, apart from it. Yoga, Ayurveda should definitely go together. Uh, it's the science part of it. It teaches you how to eat. It helps you to understand your own constitution, what foods you need to eat. It teaches you how to maintenance your body, how to cleanse your body out, it teaches you uh, what to eat. It teaches you how to even drink beverages. Like we should never, ever drink anything cold. It, it, um, teaches you your psychological part, your mental part, your emotions, uh, meditate, go out in nature. Uh, it's just a, a whole system of how to take such good care of yourself that you can stay healthy for the rest of your life. And it says life is sacred. And we have to look at that. Our life is very sacred. We're very fortunate to, to be in this physical body. You don't want to throw trash in it. It's like if you lived in a one-room house, would you throw trash in it? Would you have it stinking and do all kinds of bad things to it? Or would you take care of it? Because that's your environment. Well, this body is, is our house. It's our casing. So it teaches you how to take care of it and live a long, happy life or healthy life. Because if you don't, if you're not healthy, then what is your life, you know, like? Yeah. It's just, it's not, it's not a life. So that's what Ayurveda does. It teaches you all those different things uh, to mentally be healthy, physically be healthy, emotionally be healthy. Uh, spiritual aspect, it teaches us spirituality, uh, how to live a spiritual life. And so that's, um, I mean, it, it goes on and on. We could spend yeah. like hours on Ayurveda, but that's probably it, you know, uh, shortening what, what all it is. Yeah, it's fantastic. Like, I, I was thinking why I didn't start studying these 30 years ago. 
I'm not going to have enough time in this lifetime to study all of that. It's, it's a huge science. Yeah, there is even Ayurvedic psychology where the foods you eat and herbs that you can eat have an impact on your mind. And um, exactly, yeah. You know, obviously, and the way you act is amazing. Yeah. And another, another point also here is that, um, you know, some people, like you said, if you are not healthy, you are not living a good life. Like it's not even a life. Is that what you said? Yeah. Right. And many people I, I know, um, they, they either don't care, right, about their health and eat whatever and don't exercise, which is their choice, very respectable. But they are, I think they are missing out on a lot of things because part of feeling good, feeling energetic, and feeling healthy is part of your happiness. Like without that, you cannot be as happy as you can be in this world because you're gonna get a lot of diseases, pains, mental situations going on. You know, it's inevitable, it's just the way it is. But people are stubborn sometimes, you know, and until they don't understand that shifts in those habits is gonna make a great impact in their lives, they won't change. Right. Um... I knew a person, um, and you know, this person, and it, a lot of people have this mentality because you can buy it in the grocery store because it's out there, you know, to the public. It, oh, it's I can eat it. There's nothing wrong with eating it. And this person with a lot of a lot of meat, heavy meat diet, fried foods, just all oh, just nasty junk food. And used to tease me about my diet, what I ate. And, and I, I get that sometimes. I don't really care if people do that. I, you know. But he died of a heart attack in his 40s. And so I look at that. And I wouldn't have wished that on him at all. But I'm like, well, I'm still alive. I'm <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> uh, so it's sad. People, it's just people have a lack of knowledge and their mindset is because these foods are available it's okay for me to eat it and then again we have the media uh, they say stuff like you know milk is good uh, the incredible edible egg you have all of these things but it, who's putting this stuff out there what industries are behind it and that's what you have to people don't want to do the research they just don't want to know. They want to continue to do what they do. And if you tell people stuff long enough, they'll believe it. Right. Yeah, that's marketing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's true. And that's what it's important to be an informed consumer. Yes. Of everything. Consumer yes. of, of services, of health care. You know, inform yourself, right? Do a little investigation, information. To, to treat your body and your mind the way they deserve. You, your life is gonna be so much better. Yeah, but there is a lot of lack of knowledge, a lot everywhere, like basic things. You know, like I have a friend telling me, uh, how can I eat healthier? You know, I crave all these foods. They're addicted to, to foods, to yes. fatty foods, sugars. And it's really, we should look at it as in a compassionate way because it's really an addiction. Yes. They're addicted to it, addicted to caffeine, to sugar, to, to yonky food, because it gets the brain hooked. That's why it's so hard to stop. It's yes. For people. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand those substances are put in the foods on purpose to get you addicted. Yeah. Then you continue to buy them. Yeah, it's just, uh, they're not, they don't care about your health. They just, the money. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's also important for your happiness and well being to be aware yes. of. Okay, and so that's Ayurveda. Yeah, that's a very interesting science. And um, you don't do Ayurvedic consultations, Sherry? Not, not, you don't do that, right? Right now? I do some. Yeah, I do some. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. And, um, all right, so tell us what is the best advice you have been given in your life? 
Ah, very good question. The best advice I'd ever been given. Um, be happy for no reason. Oh, that's your mojo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be happy for no reason. Uh, I love what you do. Do what you love. Yes. That's a very good advice. Be happy for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. And just to finish, Sherry, what would you tell someone who is struggling right now? Let's say with a, a difficult situation or a physical illness or a mental disease, maybe depression, anxiety. What what would you tell them to them to to encourage them to just to be patient? Uh, well, I think, you know, some of the yogic teachings, you, they talk about that. I know this is, may sound weird to some people, but this is like a dream. This is not, um, this is really not reality. You know, when you're dreaming and you're asleep, it can be so much that you think that's real. And then when you wake up, oh, this is real. Everything passes, everything passes. And I would just say, live a good life. Find your spiritual past. Find your purpose in life. Live with purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, search it. What do you like to do? Um, even a hobby, just things you like to do, things you can offer uh, people in your life that, that will help them and do it. Pull out of it. Uh, it, it passes. Everything passes. Yes. And just understand that. And understand it's in divine order. And you got yourself into that. And that's, you know, we get into karma when we start, you know, looking at, things that are happening in our lives we created that we but we're in the driver's seat we can manage what's going on what's happening with us we have the ability to change and i would say go find a yoga class go find a yoga teacher uh, someone that can help guide you yes yes i was talking to a yoga teacher in india the other week and he said it's so important to find someone you know a guru, a friend, a sangha, a group of people who may understand you and um, uh, just share your situation. You know, you're not alone. Don't be alone struggling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Sherry. Very good. So that that's all I, I think I have. And tell us uh, where can people find you? Uh, what is your website, uh, your social media, everything you have to connect with you? Okay, so my website is www.alphaomyoga.com. And so it's alphaomyoga.com. But my, my business is called Alpha Omega. And my web, my Facebook is under Chittanandi Sherry Cherokee. But I think if you just put, pull up Sherry Cherokee, it'll pull up Chittanandi Sherry Cherokee. Okay. I think my, hmm, what is that called? Instagram may be under Sherry G, S-H-E-R-I-J-I. -I. So that's, that's how you can find me. Great. And you are teaching uh, yoga teacher training courses. Yes. In and in Mexico City. Exactly. I teach the 200 hour and the 300 hour, which makes 500 hour. And I do teach that here in Mexico City and Sayulita. In Mexico. Yes, in Mexico. Uh -huh. Okay. And are you teaching any yoga classes right now in Dallas? I do. I have a, when I'm in town, I have classes Tuesday and Wednesday evenings from seven to eight. At your studio? At my studio. Okay. All right. Anything else you want to share? No, just be happy for no reason.
Yeah, that's a great way to stop here. All right, Sherry, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was such a good episode to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Namaste. Namaste. I will see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>